Welcome back, everyone, to Out of the Main. John, this is the day I'm sure you've been waiting for for a long time. We've had drummers, we've had bass players, we've had guitar players, and now, not not just a keyboard player, but <laughs> the foremost keyboard player in the genre that we are discussing. I'm going to introduce him, Tom. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Percaro. Hey, guys. Steve, welcome, it's, it, welcome, welcome. It's an honor. Uh, you might imagine a podcast that covers music from the late 70s to the early 80s. The Picard name is uh, prolific. Uh, <laughs> on this podcast, we mention it all the time. So it's our honor to actually speak to you today. And, and welcome to the show again. And we want to start by first thanking John Zaka. Um, for listeners to an earlier episode might remember that John is doing a documentary on the life and career of Bobby Kimball for which you've been interviewed, Steve. So I wanted to kind of hear what that process was like. Thank you, John, for making the introduction. And uh, do you remember going through, uh, it's gotta be an interesting experience to relive some of those memories distant and in, in near. Sure, sure. John uh, John seems to be, uh, John's doing this documentary on Bobby and it really seems to be coming from the right place. Uh, um, Bobby is someone who, uh, while he was kind of the wild card in the group, we were such this, tight knit group of family and friends. Um, Bobby was kind of the outsider in the, in the band. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, so, uh, Bobby, I just have a very warm place in my heart for Bobby. And I was so glad to be part of, uh, John's documentary and, um, be able to talk about the good stuff. Cause you know what I mean? There were, there were definitely life's ups and downs and in the career of the band, you know, there were lots of ups and downs um, as a band and the individual people in the band. And, um, but with Bobby, it's easy to accentuate the positive, if you know what I'm trying to say. And Mm -hmm. uh, um, I have these great memories of, uh, um, of working with Bobby and of our friendship, you know? Yeah. Well, we can't wait for that to come out. Uh, we've seen some of the early releases of like, uh, you know, the, the trailers, <laughs> it's already tugging at our heartstrings, John, isn't it? Yeah. I even saw somebody today or like maybe half hour before I came up here in one of the total fan groups asking the question, when is kite on a string going to be ready? So mm-hmm. people, people want to hear it. So what else is keeping you busy these days, Steve? Uh, any new projects to talk about? Yeah, I do. Uh, I'm very, very excited these days. I'm very happy these days. I, uh, I suddenly found myself in a position where every day I get up and I just work on songs. Mm-hmm. I work on songs that I write and mm-hmm. I co-write and, um, and I get to use my studio and all this stuff that I love. Um, and I get to spend my day in the studio working on my songs, doing exactly what I want to do. I mean, I've always been in my studio, uh, um, usually, and for a lot of years, I was uh, doing a lot of film work, and and um, for a while, and then also I spent uh, from 2010 to 2019, I was on the road quite often with Toto. You know, I kind of did another what was supposed to be one summer turned into nine summers, and <laughs> um, uh, I ha- and I had a blast, and the guys were great. And it was really fun. And um, but now I was really missing being in my studio and uh, um, doing my thing. And now I've reached this point where I'm this is all I do. And I love it because, uh, um, you know, follow up for me has been very hard. It's so easy to start writing a song. It's so easy to start something with uh, with a collaborator. But finishing is uh, especially if there's no deadline. It's always been something that was always difficult for Toto, the band. Uh, you know what I mean? Without a gun to our head, we would have, uh, we'd still be working on Toto 4 right now. You know what I mean? <laughs> if it was uh, up to us. Um, but uh, so deadlines have always been a necessary thing to finish stuff. And I, one thing that film work did help me do was to learn, to kind of grow up, to be honest with you, and realize that sometimes, when I come into the studio, I mean, 95% of what I do is just fun. I really enjoy it. It's like being at Disneyland for me, you know what I mean? But when it comes to finishing stuff, every now and then it's just work, you know what I mean? Every now and then it's work. There's 
something I'd rather be doing. I'd rather be having dinner with some friends or being with my family, my kids, or watching a football game or whatever. Every now and then there is something I'd rather be doing than <laughs> than uh, coming in here and having to finish something that's that's yeah. actually work for me. That's actually hard, whether it's figuring out how to how to uh, to get a, a cue done for a t- you know for a film I'm working on or TV show or figuring out how the hell to get f- out of that bridge back to the chorus of a song, you know, um, key change, key change, right? <laughs> exactly. No, exactly. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's um, sometimes it comes easily and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. yeah sometimes you're like, bringing the stuff to life is the fun part. Shaping it into something finished. is hard. And then the second thing I know that composers have difficulty doing, cause I've had that problem is allowing something to be in the past, letting it go, calling it done and moving to the next thing. Like you said, you could still be living, working on total four to this day but at some point you have to put it aside and call it done and allow yourself to erase the board right yeah no and it's difficult it's difficult i uh um you know i had there was something uh uh in my you mentioned my my solo album before that i was out six years ago yeah well i kid you not my favorite song on there there's been something that's been bugging me. I had had the vocals arranged in a certain way on the title track. And somehow when I mixed it, the arrangement got lost. I had just kind of muted some stuff. I had, I had arranged it a certain way on my computer and it didn't come across. It didn't wind up that way on the finished product. It's a very minor, very minor detail, but it's been bugging the hell out of me for six years. And suddenly one day I, I just happened after not listening to the song for several years, I put it on and listened to it fresh and it hit me what it was exactly what it was. And I, and I actually got the tune back up from the pro tools files of the mix and fixed it. So, (laughs) So supposedly, if all the metadata stays the same, you can re-upload that and replace the one that's there. If you go want to go through that trouble, I guess. Yeah, yeah, no, and the and the be honest, the metadata isn't the same. There are some plugins that don't exist anymore. Um, uh, yeah, that aren't uh, compatible with the newest yeah. system software. And but you know what? That's okay with me. I'm mm-hmm. just gonna make it more better uh, <laughs> uh, and get back with my mixer. And uh, I'm gonna. Because this is more important that this that this arrangement aspect be right is more important to me than all of that all of those details being exactly like they were you know well if you don't mind i have a few questions about that album 2016 it's called someday somehow um listeners of the show know that we're like freaks for what we call personnel right is looking back at these old records and seeing all the same names you know Percaro is a chief among them but i look at the personnel in this record there's a few names i wanted to read off here uh letty castro michael mcdonald right steve lukather these should all be household names but there's two in particular actually a third that jump off the page at me uh given this was recorded in 2016 and i wanted you to talk through how these tracks came to be so mike Picaro was featured on bass on a number of tunes and jeff Picaro appears on drums on back to you uh-huh so that's easy uh you know whenever i would um whenever i would demo something whenever i would would get the uh um get an, a spark of a song and get a real strong start of something happening. Usually my first call would be to my brother, Mike, who for years and years just lived down the street from me. And uh, Mike would come over and throw a bass on. And sometimes the song was not even anywhere near close to being finished, but Mike would would throw a bass part on what I had. And uh, um, that survived some of those songs. You know what I mean? Some of those songs, the basic bass part, was Mike, you know, it was his bass part that uh, uh, was on there. And then, you know, I mean, look how spoiled I was every time, even though in when it was in the band Toto, Jeff and I could bump heads big time as far as technology and using drum machines and using pads and using samples and any of that kind of stuff. When it came to Toto, there could be uh, quite a bit of head bumping between us brothers. 
<laughs> um, when it was the weekend and when it was just me working on my own stuff, Jeff would come over immediately and do whatever the hell I wanted, whatever I asked him to do, he'd be glad to. He'd be glad to experiment. He'd be glad to try stuff. He'd be glad to play on pads, to use whatever kind of synth stuff, to play to a click or do whatever I I asked him to do. And um, look how spoiled I was. Look who I always had playing on my demos. You yeah. know what I mean? My first that call sounded like always... something maybe from the era of Seventh One. Is that about when it was recorded? The, that drum track, maybe? Or uh, no, uh, the song uh, actually that was uh, Toto had cut that song, and I had done a couple versions of it. Toto had done had done it a couple times, and I had recorded it myself at David Page's studio. And I'm trying to think exactly when did you say the seventh one? That's just kind of the vibe I got of the way no, he was playing this, the room around the drums. No, and stuff. because uh, I think it was earlier than that. Because okay. the seventh one, I wasn't a band member anymore. Right. Right. Um. And I think so, yeah, this would have been before that. And it just never made the final batch of songs, you know. But I had a complete drum track. I found a version that had a, there was actually two or three versions of the song Back to You. Um, and uh, I grabbed uh, my brother Mike's bass part, my brother Jeff's drum track, and finished it. You know what I mean? Um, and then did yep. new synths on it, you know. So maybe that gives us an opportunity to maybe go back to the Toto era just a little bit. We could even go further back if we want, John. But before sure. you do, before you okay. do, I have a, a, a sort of an addendum question to that because I know okay. your album, your solo album, someday somehow came out 2016. Mm -hmm. um, Toto 14 was 2015, and you have a song on there called uh, "Little Things," which sounds a lot like it could have belonged on your solo record. Was there any connection? Did one start to inspire the other? uh the you know 14 get you going to start this solo absolutely. album or what happened there absolutely and you didn't mention my song bend that was on the japanese only version i don't have that one but <laughs> yeah, it's, you can find it on you can uh uh it's uh it's up there on youtube you know All what right. i mean just yep. toto bend um both of those were songs that were going to be for my solo album mm. But uh, uh, yeah, I found myself, uh, um, I'd been compiling stuff that was eventually going to be on a, on a solo album. And, uh, but then uh, we st Toto included me. I wasn't officially yeah. uh, a band member, but uh, uh, they kind of made it look that way uh, for the Toto 14 album. Um, they call it Toto. They called it Toto, and and they included me completely in the in the production and in the writing. And uh, um, um, yeah, I had that song. The little things was one yeah. of the things I just finished. Uh, uh, I'd finished it somewhat recently with Ali Willis, the lyricist. Uh, we had just kind of that was our. We had just started working together, and uh, that was our the first thing we did. Yeah, and I was so much big heavy stuff on that record that that one really stands out when it comes on it's just it, it's really? so warm right. and, and easy on the ears i love that love that song I really do oh great thank you thank you yeah now, now I, you may I, take us back i owe but, uh, i owe a lot of that to ali ali you know, okay. was uh very big in the writing of that um okay. it was actually kind of funny because i i wanted to get together with uh um lyrics have always been a weak point for my own for my stuff and i I wanted to get more collaborators as far as lyrics went. Uh, just that my musical output far outweighed any lyrical output I ever had. And um, so I got together with Ali to do words, you know what I mean? To mostly do words. And I had all the chord changes. The track was, was all done. But what was funny was that uh, I really had no melody yet and, and wasn't sure. And, um, what wound up being very strange is that she came up with most of the melody. Mm. And then when I got to writing the words, she goes, so what do you think we should say here? And I would say a phrase and she'd go, let's use that. And she'd write it down. And then she'd go, then what should we say? And I'd go, well, you know, we should try to say this somehow. And she'd go, that's perfect. And she'd Sometimes write Sometimes all you need is a sounding board. That's and I, I ex well, exactly. And I, I pretty much wound up writing all the lyrics. <laughs> and she wrote the melody for the most part. So it was pretty yeah, fun. Wow. Oh, and she God, just was uh, a great collaborator. Yeah. Interesting. And I, so I was, of course, I was completely devastated and heartbroken, like many in our community, when she uh, uh, 
uh, passed away just mm. not too long later. You know? Yep, for sure. Well, I did want to hear the flip side to the, uh, you said there's kind of almost two sides to Jeff Picaro, the one on the weekend, easy going. Yeah. Tell me what you want for my understanding of what I've read and heard from prior guests is that back in the day in the Toto era, even some of the session era stuff is that he, I, I get the sense that kind of all eyes were on Jeff early on during tracking. And it wasn't until Jeff was happy with the drum track that they could move on. Is that an accurate uh, depiction of reality or how would you contrast? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's pretty accurate. And that would, that would, you could say that about, you know, I think in my opinion, not every single one, but a lot of the sessions Jeff did, you know, even though there'd be an artist and a producer there and an engineer, um, Jeff kind of, it really, in the studio, in those days, you know, pre-digital, it was really about getting the drum track. Everybody's uh, goal, even on on tracking sessions, was nailing down that drum track because it was easy with all the isolation, right? Especially with the kind of sessions we did and how isolated the guitars and the bass basses were and the keyboards. Everyone else could easily punch in and fix stuff. You know, it was really the drummer that was very dodgy, punching in with sustaining cymbals and, uh, uh, you know, the way tape worked back then. Punching in was a, a, a dodgy prospect if, if there was something wrong with the drum track. So it was really all about kind of nailing down the drum track, getting the drum track. And... Who else was going to tell you when you had the drum track other than than Jeff knew? You know what I mean? Yeah. Sure, yeah. there were producers that had input and artists definitely had input and engineers who definitely had input. But I think most people kind of looked at Jeff. How was that one? Was that good for you? Do you, you know what I mean? Do you want another one? Do you need another one? You know, Jeff didn't like doing a whole lot of them because he would start getting tired, to tell you the truth. You know, mm-hmm. uh, um, so yeah, it was kind of all about, and especially in Toto, where Jeff was a co-producer. So he would, you know, every time we would start an album project, they would start off with, come on, let's let's all get in the studio like a band and let's cut, let's record these songs like a band, come on. And we'd all set up in the studio, including me, including me, we'd all kind of get set up, you know, we'd all get set. We did this about it just about every, most albums that every time we'd start an album this would be the thing we'd start you know we'd start and then you know once they locked in on what which song we were doing one by one we'd be dismissed (laughs) always starting with me you know (laughs) always starting with me yeah those will be overdubs don't worry about that and i you know my my time was always uh, a little on top of it for my brother you know i just it's just the way i'm wound uh um same um, in my brother yeah 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 <laughs> yeah I, I play a little behind he plays a little ahead so we're, yeah. we're always and, nulled and jeff hated that you know yeah. what i mean this is why he loved cutting with guys like david page and david foster they michael omarty and these guys had such great yeah. they they laid back and had such a great pocket you know laid back without dragging yeah and uh uh were always a great point of reference and i mean Sometimes everybody in the studio would get dismissed. <laughs> you know what I mean? A lot of times it would wind up being Paige and Jeff. Yep. You know? And the only reason Paige was there was so Jeff knew where he was in the song. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so so when, when it came down to that then, so because I've read that that's sort of the way Africa was built up, was the two of them and then everything else came on. Did you like it better to not have to deal with the the session and actually be able to at your comfort level come back later and add your parts and not be under the gun under the microscope people telling you you're playing ahead did did you like okay now you guys leave and let me do my thing absolutely there was no (laughs) argument for me when i would uh uh there was no argument for me whatsoever you know what i mean that was definitely the hot seat you know what i mean (laughs) to be in those tracking sessions and i was uh um you know, it was all about being productive and getting it done and uh, uh, getting a real solid, steady drum track was, you know what I mean, was uh, paramount when we were cutting tracks the way we worked. And uh, um, however, however, we could all help make that happen, even if it was by 
mm-hmm. laying back. Right. Um, um, you know, we did it. You know. Well, I have a question about this. Is sort of an aside, but it'll eventually get us back to it because. Uh, when we see your name credited, it's often synth related, whether it's credited as synth player or a lot of programming. The famous uh, picture of you standing in front of the modular synth that makes it around, uh, you know, you, you had the long black hair and all that. It, it's made its way around Facebook probably a couple thousand times. But uh-huh. I, I had a question that during your days when you were getting session calls above mm-hmm. and beyond Toto, did you ever get calls for? straight up piano or straight up like Rhodes or was it always just as a synth guy no I did some sessions like that I sure I did a few things some of the very first stuff I did was playing piano on on uh you know either demos or some tracking sessions occasionally uh um Michael Boddicker helped me you know get started in the studios he he was a uh, um you know he would uh have me sub for him when he was getting double booked and stuff like that. And some of those things, it was like, yeah, it was either like a single line synth thing or they would just sometimes copy the piano part and give it to the synth guy to, to double on roads. And, um, um, you know, um, so I, I, I sat in that chair a few times, but I, uh, you know, where I belonged was being an overdub guy, you know? Was that because of comfort level or was that like a business decision? You saw a niche you could fill because you understood the gear. Well, that was really the whole thing. That's why I got as deep into it uh, as I did was I saw that opening back then. You know what I mean? That all those great keyboard players, whether it was David Page or David Foster or, you know, um, anyone you can name, the really, really, really good players were not, especially pre-MIDI, uh, you know what I mean? Where yeah. it took a special cable to play a mini Moog from another synthesizer. It took some converter box or whatever. Um, you know, guys were in the synths and had a keyboard on it and they, you know, they wanted to be able to play it. But as far as really knowing what you were doing on it, there was only so far these guys would go uh being the pure players that they were and at the same time the the on the opposite end of the spectrum you know the guys that knew the most about synths were these nerds were the guys with pocket protectors <laughs> and uh they were you know what i mean i mean i'm being I um, that's a generalization yeah. and uh but you know what i'm saying the guys yes. that knew the most the guys that built it weren't guys that you want to dial in your your funk Moog bass sound, you know what I mean, or or try playing it, you know. Um, Do you ever you know, tinker around with that gear to this day, Steve? Do you ever tinker around with that old vintage synth gear and say, "Oh, let's go back and"? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but now, I mean, we can get into that later. I mean, now there's a lot of people that see me uh, that wonder why I'm not using more analog stuff and. The guys that are, especially younger guys that are purists and and uh, um, wonder why I don't uh, exploit that stuff more nowadays than I like I used to. And, um, the, you know, the answer is simply because I'm all about songwriting now and going okay. from tune to tune to tune to tune. Um, yeah. I mean, back in those days, I wanted to show what could be done. Uh, mm-hmm. It was very uh, it was very difficult. I loved being that guy. To go back to what we were talking about, I loved being that guy. I found that slot where uh, um, I was handy to have around. And I loved, I always loved from from elementary school where I met this kid, Peter Rylick, who who was better than me at piano and stuff. I, lo- I became friends with him. He became my best friend immediately. Uh, um, I always loved working with other keyboard players especially ones that were better than me. It was just about loving keyboards and, uh, um, you know, Paige and I together were a formidable team. You know what I mean? Walking into a session, we kind of would have things covered. You know what I mean? I'd go in there and a lot of people would hire me um, because of my synth stuff, but I loved having David tag along with me or, and with him vice versa. If he was all of a sudden, sometimes people would just call on him. And uh, if he thought there was any chance he was going to have to do anything with synths, you know what I mean? He loved having me tagging along with him, 
You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, together it was covered. You know what I mean? We were covered. If someone needed some to improvise jazz and blow over changes, that hey, was you. You're in. Oh, that's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? That yeah. was not me at all. Yeah. You know what I mean? I've never played at the baked potato in my life. Right. I've never been asked and never will be asked to play at the baked potato <laughs> in my entire life. Uh, but when it comes to the electronic side, because you mentioned like taking one keyboard and figuring out how do you make this keyboard control this keyboard and the different connection box. So a lot of people, uh, maybe they do or maybe they don't know, but you played that iconic riff on Don Henley's Dirty Laundry. Mm -hmm. Now, I, from what I understand, it started with organ, but there's more going on there than just organ. Is that true? What, what's all going on in that sound? Yeah, no, it was just all about, uh, uh, I got called very late at night by my brother, Jeff, uh, uh, by my brother, Jeff, he'd been working on the, on, on this with Don and they just, they wanted this thing. They wanted it to be this real Farfisa that, that Danny Cooch had there. Um, and they just wanted it completely nailed. You know, they wanted it to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And, uh, again, it was kind of, it was this, I love talking about that session because it was really where, uh, the music and the technology kind of met. Thank God Greg Ladani uh, um, had recorded the sync tone of the drum machine. They had done it to a click. They recorded, uh, it was done to drum machine. And, but still, even if people were using drum machine in those days and recording it, very rarely did anyone record the sync tone so that you could mm. sync it up again. Or know that, that you had to record the sync tone first, then the drum machine, otherwise they wouldn't be in alignment. Mm -hmm. Right, because you of the could delay. Record them at the same time. Oh, you could okay. record them as you were recording the uh, the drum part. Oh, okay. Um, we always um, had sync issues with that, but um, we were using a different sequencer back in the day. Mm -hmm. No, and that was normally yeah. the thing. But I think uh, I think Greg just recorded it as they were recording the basic. Uh, okay. Uh, but I walked in. And that was the first thing I looked at when I realized what they wanted to do, and. Uh, um, what I did, what I did was, uh, uh, I just gated the the. They didn't want it to be a synthesizer for sure. They wanted it to be this Farfisa organ that was sitting there, and I just simply um, got the drum machine back in sync, and programmed on a cowbell the pattern that they wanted the organ to be playing. But da 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 da. Ba, and you're just ba, holding keys da. down. And I'm just holding keys down. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, the Farfisa is being fed through, a, through an amplifier. You know, I brought a little piece of modular gear. Actually, yeah. that one that's behind me mm. is actually ex the exact piece I brought with me for Dirty Laundry. Wow. I, I asked the right question to the right, uh, yeah. right person. Well, yeah, no, the <laughs> right. timing was right. The right time. I, yeah. I, uh, um, that's actually all I brought with me to the session. What is that? It's just a little piece of uh, Polyfusion modular gear. And it's got a couple of VCAs. It's got a envelope follower where it'll take an audio signal and produce a gate. You follow that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then I those do. envelopes that are in there, um, it's got a couple of VCAs that I just, I put the organ through there. So it was the real organ sound. And the, uh, whenever the, um, not to get too techy, but uh, uh, it made it so that the cowbell pattern I programmed would open up would open up the VCAs um, that had the organ going through it only when it got the cowbell pattern. And any other layers are all effects like delays or reverb. Yeah, well, right? then that's, there's that's tons it? of yeah. stuff afterwards. Yeah. And yes, we put a little tape slap on it. Uh, but as far it doesn't as sound that, like a, an organ anymore. That's for sure. It sounds like you can hear that there's maybe an organ in there, but it does. It ends up sounding more like a synth. If you ask me, I'm sorry to tell Danny that, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sounds cool. But, uh, yeah, that's amazing. Sound is that sound is pretty much just that, you know what I mean? Um, we did tons of stuff. Don was great. Don was, uh, uh, I had told him about this thing that had been released a couple of weeks ago, but that the, you couldn't get one. It was called, uh, it was called an emulator. There was this mm. cool thing I thought that we could do some interesting things on. And I says, but I can't, I can't get a hold of one. And I was pretty well connected yeah. in the synth world then, but, um, Boy, a couple days later, Don had one there at the studio, uh, mm. um, and uh, we used it quite a bit. Cool. Well, Steve, I hope uh, if you don't mind indulging us, we can't let the occasion of a Steve Picaro interview come and go without asking you about the iconic synth solo in Rosanna, John. And we've talked about this multiple times in multiple ways. So we'll, 
rather yes. than just having a riff on it. What do we want to know that's new? Well, what we want to know, so kind of take us into the, your process. So to me, there's three elements of it. There's the, you probably had to design most of those sounds from scratch because I think we were probably still predating being able to just punch up presets, right? But you had to come up with, you've come up with multiple synth sounds that all have to have their own voice, their own sound so that they have, they speak their own way. They can layer over each other. And then there is the, this is not, as Tom said, it's not you just went in and ripped a solo. You wrote parts that cascade over each other. All of that, you're on your own, I guess, at this point. They said, here's your, what is it, eight bars? Um, what was your process like? Did you start creating the sounds? Did you start creating ideas musically and then find sounds? How did you go about it? Well, just to, to precursor it a little bit, you know, I'd been getting very frustrated um, uh with my with my place in the band as the as the uh, resident you know synth geek you know what i mean it uh um the guy all the guys in the band whether it was my brothers or david page or steve lukather these guys were all so talented they could sit down on a toto session just like they would on any other session they did and uh uh lukather was just brilliant at coming up with guitar parts He'd hear something, he'd hear a song, and he just, the parts he would come up with were just, you know what I mean, on yeah. my songs, on everyone's songs, on all the sessions he did, he just would come up with these parts so quickly and and be able to execute them beautifully like that, you know? Uh, the same with my brother Jeff, right? He, right? he would just, he'd hear a song, they would map it out, and boom, you know, they would be able to do it. Um, I was always frustrated with, with synthesizers, um, because I could be very fast on sessions. I could do a three hour session with a Quincy Jones or a David Foster, and we could do, get the synths done on three songs in three hours. Okay. Uh, as far as what they were asking of me to do, um, I could, I could, I could work very fast like that but i was always uh haunted by what the possibilities were mm. you know quite often they would say hey yeah let's do a string part you know do it give us some string sounds and let's do a string part and i'd be thinking yeah i can kind of improvise a string arrangement and we could do a pads pass i'll look at the chord chart and we'll do a pads pass and then we'll do a pass of like single line of a single line string thing but I was always frustrated in thinking, you know, I learned how to write for strings. You know, I went to s school and studied that. Boy, if I could be at home and if they would show you the respect that they would show a string arranger mm -hmm. who wasn't expected to improvise his <laughs> string arrangements, <laughs> right, right? right? He went home and wrote that out and looked at the melody and looked at the chord changes and took his time. You know what I mean? If I would spend that kind of time on synths, that the result would be much hipper, you know? And I, I, uh, it being Toto, it being my band, I wanted to show what could be done if, more, if I had more time. Now, the problem was is that I wasn't an engineer. I had no idea really how to record. And um, on top of that, you know, on our, th on our third album, just for you to know, before Toto 4, on our third album, David had put together this amazing studio that we uh, uh, called the manor and and um, I had all all of our synths were all set up all the time and going and um, and we had this for the third album we had this eight track we had this eight track Otari and uh, I said to my I I thought oh I know what I'll do I'll um while the guys are doing their overdubs and cutting tracks I'll transfer the rhythm tracks to a couple tracks of the eight track and I'll do some experiments. I'll experiment, and then when it's time to do my synths with the engineer and the guys in the studio, I'll know what I want to do. I'll have had, you know, I'll have done my experiments and know what I want to do. Well, reality was I killed myself on that eight track. I doubled stuff. I combined it. I did all kinds of stuff that you know what no one wound up hearing. There was no way. There were sounds I got up on modular. <laughs> huge modular sounds that I was never going to be able to get those up again. Those yeah. were presets you could save. Right. I wasn't going to be able to recreate that stuff with how much of that I did. 
And it was so it was very, very frustrating because, I mean, to this day, there's that's some of my best work I ever did. And to this day, no one's ever heard it. (laughs) So um, David had then gotten uh, two 24 tracks, the Atari 8 track, which was just the wrong format, right? There was no way to sync it up at the time. David finally got two 24 track tape machines. And, um, And I went to Jeff Workman who I actually really bumped heads with. We didn't get along very well on the third Toto album. He was the engineer co-producer. But I asked him, I said, you know, I knew I wasn't an engineer. I knew I didn't at the time know how to engineer. I said, if I recorded myself, if they made me what we called slave tapes Mm -hmm. in those days, if they made me a tape to work to, why couldn't they use what I did? Hmm. Why wouldn't it be able to be used? And he just kind of, uh, um, he wound up very patiently showing me, teaching me about gain structure, Mm. about where to turn what up, when and how, and the concept of zero VU. And if things are aligned right, (laughs) you know what I mean? And luckily, mattered back then. On this Trident Flexi mix that had all these meters on it, even the effect sends had meters. So I could see he was like, as long as you're not you know, going way, way too far in the red over here and you got a nice healthy level. Now we'll go to the effect and turn it up here. He kind of just taught me the right order to turn things up and just taught me basic gain structure so that I was getting a nice level on tape, a nice, healthy, clean level on tape. Um, so that's the precursor. Sorry if that's too long. Yeah. Okay. But uh, it made it so that when it got time for the song Rosanna, which is really the first tune we were working on, and uh, they had already done the horn arrangement, as a matter of fact. And David Page had done a rough, he did a keyboard solo that I wasn't even around when he did it. He did it in the studio. He mostly did it on Hammond organ. Um, But I knew I wanted to do something special there. This was a real Toto song. It was, you know, my, my brother Jeff had done this great groove. David had written this great song and and uh, there was this space where there was going to be a keyboard solo and I knew I wanted to do something special and I I took my time I I took my time and experimented and uh, um, wound up writing it out writing out different aspects of it when I came up with the opening line uh, um, you know I wanted this real big fanfare thing and and uh, introducing it and um, Anyway, uh, it wasn't until the day before we were mixing the song and David and I had really gone, you know, David was right in there with me, doing a whole lot of it with me. Uh, um, David, you know, I made him write out the sequencer part, three-part harmony that wound Mm -hmm. up being all, you know, the modular stuff, this cascading sequencer part going on. It wasn't just a random arpeggiator which is what I would might maybe do in a studio or just a single line sequence that I would do stuff like that in the studio. Quite often we actually wrote out the three part harmony of this cascading part, all this stuff that you couldn't do on a session or would want to yeah. do with five other guys <laughs> yeah. looking over your shoulder like this, yeah, looking at their watch. Yet. Come on. Let's go. Looking up, you know what I mean? None of yeah. them would have the patience for that, you know? And I, and understandably, understandably, yeah. um, Anyway, so that was the perfect example. And what a cool song to be able to do it on. You know what I mean? On a number two hit song uh, with this great drum groove and this incredible Bobby Kimball performance on vocals along with Luke. And uh, um, I got to do my thing. I got to do this where the guy who mixed it, who happened to be Greg Ladani, had nothing to do with the rest of the record. Oh. When he got it that day, when it was time to mix the song, he just had left and right, synth solo, left and right. He had no idea who recorded it or how they recorded it. Oh, my God. Where it was recorded. He just, it was synth solo, left and right. And all that was basically panty, pre-mixed, yeah. All, all that, that stuff was, was, I had bounced it down the night before. You know? Excellent. Wow. So, <laughs> Well, even so, all that other stuff that was so brilliant that nobody's ever going to hear, at least that is truly immortal. And it is. we'll be hearing it forever and ever and ever. Awesome. Uh, God, did you have something teed up? Because I had a, a like a sort of a meta question on Toto just in general. Okay, go ahead. 
just because you've been talking about the various musicians, well, first of all, I'm relieved to hear that your answer to the last question just wasn't, oh, that was take zero. I didn't even know the thing was running. I just played it. Because <laughs> that's what we've uh, come to expect from the Toto Cats. But so yeah. Toto as a band and as individuals, you, you, there's so many different sounds that you guys are like so adept at, whether it's the what we would consider the Yachty stuff like Boz and some of the Toto catalog. But there's, you know, Prague you guys are so good at and what I, I would consider power pop and power ballads. I mean, did you guys ever have either a discussion or individually have a sense for like, this is sort of the t- center of the Toto sound and all of these others are arms that come off of it? Or was Toto really the sum of its parts? Yeah, you know, probably not enough, you know, uh, um, we probably didn't have that enough. And so certain albums we'd go off on certain tangents and uh uh you know we loved it all you know what i mean we you know um yeah i don't know total four is where it came together and in a song like rosanna you kind of heard you heard it all it all kind of came together there um but i would say more that it's a, a, a some of its parts there was you know there wasn't a lot of uh um thought put into okay now on this album we're going to go more in this direction and this we're going to go more in that direction just more of these influences just kind of came out of us and uh uh you know david page would constantly be hearing me i'd be playing him keith emerson stuff and listening to close to the edge and uh uh um you know and my brother jeff who was the one who hit me to all that stuff he not long after got away from that stuff because it uh you know, he was so obsessed with groove and pocket and mm. and all that kind of thing, of which that stuff wasn't about. Um, yeah, you got to play with Yes later on, though. I don't want to go down that tangent, but uh, you had a couple tracks with them, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, but anyway, I, I, uh, um, all that stuff showed up in our music, and it still does. You know. Well, then Africa is the other big, big one, and I know you've probably been asked about that a million times, but. You know, going forward, it seems like because I'm a keyboard player too, um, and I've got a lot of virtual synths. I got the regular synths, and everybody knows that when you open up one of those things and start going through presets, invariably you're going to come across something that either says Toto Brass or Africa Brass, right? It's funny. It, it, well, I'm sure you've even seen it too. So that sound, they're they're pointing to you with it, but I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna ask: Is it proper to attribute that the concept of that sound t- to you? Or did you hear that somewhere else and you just started to use it more regularly? Or And then I also want to know about the marimba sound, where that came from, because that's probably pre-emulator too, I'm thinking. Yeah, no, and that's the interesting part. The the okay. brass stuff, um, I, when you're referring to total brass and presets, it's usually, uh, um, it's usually like a lead brass sound, okay. with what I call the blip in it. Mm-hmm. which was a, a trick Roger Lynn showed me where that came from. The perfect example is on Frank Zappa's Chic Your Booty album. Tommy Mars does a synth break. There's a synthesizer break in the middle of the song. And uh, the, just the, the synth sounds on it are amazing. And when I first got my modular system, and I really didn't know what the hell I was doing with it, I just got it mostly for voices. I wanted multiple voices i wanted multiple mini mogs mm-hmm. to use with the sequencer i was using at the time but i i remember roger lynn who knew a lot about synthesis uh and was a was a was a dear friend i played him that chic your booty break and this brass sound that tommy mars had gotten up in particular and i was like how the hell is he doing that how do i do that and roger knew exactly what it was was this 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 um technique of blipping one oscillator one of two oscillators using a little envelope and having it go out of tune real quick at the beginning something that lyle mays did to real cool effect with you know in different ways on on some of their stuff but um i really exploited it and uh uh, used it quite a bit and in the rosanna solo it's kind of part of uh, uh i think we did a little bit in 99 early on but um Anyway, that was definitely uh, um, not my own invention by any stretch at all. That was uh, from Tommy Mars and uh, on that Chic Your Booty album, Yo Mama, song Yo Mama. It still sounds great. 
um, that's where I got that from, and I exploited the hell out of it. The actual brass sound on Africa and a lot of Toto songs is the preset CS80 brass one and two. You know, we good would, thing it was I, a preset because that thing is a bear to program. It too. was a preset. <laughs> no, and I, I, I believe me, I most of what I did on a CS80 was my own sounds where, you know, were my own sounds, but I tried to recreate that brass sound, you know, to better it. Uh, Cause anything that was in a preset, you could do it manually in there. And I knew that synth in and out, but nailing that brass sound was very, very elusive. And we always kind of wound up going back to that preset, mm-hmm. which was quite a bit. And that's the pad. That's the synth pad throughout Africa. You know, and on a lot of Toto stuff from the very first album, Child's Anthem, uh, the brass pads were that CS80 preset. Now, the marimba sounds were that's you even think DX7, right? That's oh, everybody thought it was DX7. At least all the people I hung around with thought it was the marimba and the DX7. But no, this is way before that. then. Yeah. There was no such thing as a DX7 right. when we did Toto 4. It was the GS1 which was not programmable. It had these little strips and they had all these presets. But because of my relationship, I had developed this relationship with Yamaha and they actually hooked me up. Uh, There was a guy named Gary Lewenberger. Not only was, there still is a guy named Gary (laughs) Lewenberger. Uh, um, (laughs) And a guy, also Dave Bristow, but especially Gary Lewenberger was was key. He, He did a lot of what they called voicing or programming for the GS1. They had this very strange, uh, you can look it up online. It was this, it had four TV screens. It was this very strange four operator FM uh, uh, system of FM. And, um, you You know, the DX7 is a six operator FM. You'd think you could get a better sound, but there was just something magical about this stuff that Gary did the way he dialed in David and I, he sat down with David and I, and we dialed in these, those Kalimba slash Marimba sounds on a GS one. Ah, I see it here. Yeah. Wow. Specifically for Africa. And, uh, um, yeah. Um, it looks like a pianet or something. Yeah. Very strange, very wow. strange looking synth, uh, very un, they cut, they listed for $16,000 and they weren't even programmable. You know, <laughs> wow. The most uncost effective synth in the history of mankind. But you made it uh, so cool iconic. about Yamaha that because of that, they were able to figure out how to make a, uh, a DX7. That brought the next thing. The yeah. most cost effective synth in the history of mankind. So, uh, you know, you got to give it to Yamaha. And possibly the most used synth of all time. As it yeah. eventually and overused. Out. Yeah. <laughs> and overused. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, John, you didn't want to go down a rabbit hole, but I'm curious because I bet oh. not a lot of people know the full rabbit hole that is your affiliation with the Yes Guys, which eventually finds its way back to the Someday Somehow album because Billy Sherwood's brother, Michael, right? Aren't they brothers? Yeah. And he appears quite uh, extensively on your record. So take us through that little chronology, if you don't mind. Yeah, my brother, we were rehearsing at Leeds uh, Rehearsal Studios. My my best friend, Andy Leeds, had owned these rehearsal uh, studios that we rehearsed at. And my brother, Jeff, called me out of the rehearsal studio one day, says, you got to hear this band that's rehearsing over here. And I listened to them. And actually, we wound up going in and watching them. It was a, these kids from Las Vegas, and the name of the band was Logic. And they just were amazing. All of them were amazing. And their sound guy was amazing the way he was – cueing tape slaps in and just working it and uh i love these guys and uh um david and i and and tom knox wound up producing an album we wound up getting them a record deal with a and m and um the bass player was this young kid billy sherwood and his older brother mike was the keyboard player and mike and i uh wound up uh um becoming writing partners he was one of my main guys for quite a while when i really first got into writing songs a lot. He was not only my, my, my lyricist on a lot of my early stuff um, that wasn't just on my own, but uh, he was just an incredibly musical guy. Um, unfortunately, he's no longer with us. Um, in 19, I guess it was 92, um, 
Billy had started. Uh, Billy Sherwood had begun uh, a relationship with uh, with the guys in Yes, Chris Squire, his yep. hero, right. in particular, and Alan White. And uh, Billy was doing some writing with Chris, and they were doing some stuff. And uh, anyway, Chris wound up doing this thing called the uh, uh, the Chris Squire Experiment. He had this little short lived band that was him and Alan White. And uh, there was also Mark Williams, Joseph Williams' brother. Oh, wow. I played didn't know that. Drums, played some drums in it. It was Billy. Jimmy Hahn, the guitar player from Logic, was in it. And uh, and I was doing keys. I was doing uh, keyboards in it. I'd been out of Toto for a little while and was kind of floundering around. And they asked me if I'd be interested in doing this. And these guys were such my heroes. Uh, I was glad to. And uh, we did like a 10-city tour of California we just played clubs up and down the West Coast, and uh, that was pretty much the end of it. And then Jonathan Elias, uh, a producer that had been working with uh, that had been working with John Anderson, mm -hmm. and, uh, and a lot of the guys in Logic wound up. Jonathan had a jingle house yep. called Elias in, in Santa Monica, and I, I know mean, him well. Yeah, yeah, a lot of those guys what were working there: uh, Jimmy Hahn, Mike Sherwood. Uh, I even think Billy might have been there for a little while. Um, no wonder I couldn't get any gigs. I lost them all to Elias Music. Now I get it. <laughs> there you go. Uh, <laughs> no, he still does quite a lot of stuff. They, uh, um, Jonathan had started working with John Anderson yep. and uh, had brought us in on this Union album. And uh, um, that was kind of a strange experience. Um, um, and I know that like Rick Wakeman, you know, of course, one of my heroes you know totally hated the fact that us you know a band like yes that la studio musicians would brought in a pop in, guy <laughs> would be called in to play on a yes album i know he hated it and he <laughs> hated what we did and he hated the songs we worked on and uh, uh what can ah, i tell well, you? well ah, just well. real quick while we're in the rabbit hole because i found myself uh making a fortuitous discovery in this rabbit hole john i should save this for found at sea but i'm not going to but uh so you played with billy sherwood in robin ford right on this return to the dark side of the mood mm -hmm. uh, moon it was a tribute album right and you yeah no i didn't work with anybody billy started doing this side thing where he would do these tribute albums mm -hmm. Billy was producing uh uh Billy was always real good in the studio, and he was uh, um, some company. There was a, co a a company that started hiring Billy to do a series of tribute albums. Billy did many of these, and uh, uh, so I was never in the studio with Robin Ford or anything like that. Billy just would ask me. He would reach out to all these different guys and uh, ask them to do overdubs to contribute parts. You know, uh, everyone was kind of working in isolation back okay. then. So you sent the synth part that you did in that tune? Yeah, I believe so. It's pretty killer. You you told us you didn't want us to just turn you loose on something. So I, I'm going to – the I don't know where to begin to ask you about human nature. I know so many things have been asked of you. I would like you to dispel the rumor or tell the story about it uh, being discovered on a used cassette. But the other part – I wanted to ask is is there anything about that session or the prepping you did beforehand the that you had built it all out with your arpeggiators and drum machine and is there anything about that that you weren't asked that you wish you were that you wanted to tell any little nuance or anything that's a good question uh and the answer is no <laughs> <laughs> no i'm glad to uh uh yes it was a used cassette i i uh i was the um I was the house engineer at David Page's studio, the manor. <laughs> Quincy Jones had been, I'd been working on the album already doing synth sessions for the Thriller album. Um, but he had been asking, he wasn't asking me for songs. He was asking David Page for songs. And, and the direction was he was looking for something like My Sharona. Wow. Couldn't have been further away from a human nature. <laughs> you know what I mean? He was asking David for up-tempo stuff. And David was in the studio uh was in his home studio working on stuff and um quincy was sending an assistant to pick up pick up tapes to pick up cassettes and believe me we used to buy uh, uh cassettes by the case yeah but um 
we had we had been on the road you know we were on the road and back home we're doing sessions and then we'd be back on the road uh, for total four and and it was a lot of back and forth and i worked on human nature a lot on the road on a four track cassette i'd done a lot of work on it and um i had just had gotten home and i'd made a copy i'd made a a, a little two track of the where it was at right then and uh, it was just me singing a rough vocal singing the same verse lyric kind of over and over again and uh um but i had my tape slaps for the why for the chorus part were happening and uh you know it was all about the atmosphere for me and mm -hmm. uh um anyway i had just made a i had just made a cassette of it um and suddenly david had called down to me and said hey those two things we were working on last night that you know those two things that he that he was working on last night i was helping him with he said throw those on cassette quincy's assistant's coming over to pick them up and uh and that was the last cassette some people think i had some ulterior motive <laughs> i would have never it was an unfinished song the there were no finished lyrics on it there was no vocal i would ever 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 in a million years present to a quincy jones i immediately fast forward the tape turned it over and relabeled it and put <laughs> david's songs on so that that's what he would hear when he put the a side wow. set in you know <laughs> and then it wasn't until the thriller 25 anniversary release where there was a quincy jones interview on it you know, and he said how, I mean, the detail of, of um, this was the missing piece as far as how he heard it. Uh, um, he said he had, he said how he had listened to the David's, the cassette we had given him. And I think he just left it going. He just left it going and went about his business in his office. And uh, obviously auto reverse kicked in, mm -hmm. you know, now these tapes that we made, these were custom these were usually custom tapes and there was like enough room for two songs on it. But I, I hated using 60 minute cassettes or something like that when most of the time we were recording one or two songs. So we had these custom like 10 minute cassettes made, you know. Um, so it must not have been that long where auto reverse kicked in and he heard <laughs> my version of human nature and just really dug the uh, uh, love the vibe of it love the atmosphere of it wow so then was it michael who finished the lyrics or did they ask you to write no, lyrics no i they asked me to finish the lyrics which i did and quincy was very underwhelmed he loved my title <laughs> he loved my chorus you know what i mean but my verse lyrics were kind of it was a little too personal or whatever and mm. and uh, he asked me he said do you mind if i let someone have a go at the verse lyrics and i was like absolutely i had abs you know I didn't have to even think about it. I was like, sure. And uh, he called up a publisher uh, um, who hooked him up with John Bettis. Mm -hmm. And uh, John Bettis did the verse lyrics. We kind of got together. I remember the first time Quincy showed me the verse lyrics and I was like, they were perfect to me. And uh, um, we kept my chorus intact exactly like it was lyrically. And uh, we kept my title. And um, that was great. I mean, you know, I, I can't give John Bettis enough credit for elevating this, you know, taking this record and turning it into a song. You know what yeah. I mean? Giving it a, a narrative, a beginning and a middle and an end and uh, uh, just elevating it, you know. To well, you got level. yourself into a little trouble. Uh, was it once before or once after? I'm trying to get the chronology right. Where you sang like a scratch vocal and then you never got the opportunity to fix it, right? I'm thinking of the stories I've heard about It's a Feeling from Toto 4. Didn't you say something about the second verse you intended to yeah, rewrite the lyrics? Yeah, that was one that got away with me. I'm, that's <laughs> something I'm kind of really embarrassed about. You know what I mean? Is that, but that's that such was... an atmospheric song that the repeat lyric to actually works from the listener's standpoint to me. I'm glad to hear it you really does from your mouth you know what i mean <laughs> because uh you know i always meant to write another verse you know what i mean to write another verse there and i just <laughs> i i never could and i should have asked for help i should have uh done something uh but um it is what it is and um 
It definitely. Everyone, everyone loves it. Everyone loves yeah, it. Yeah, no, it's definitely. one of my favorite things because it's yeah. so out there. It's in yes. such this weird key. The chord changes are so are so strange. Uh, um, and James Newton Howard string arrangement done in London at Abbey Road with the LS. You know what I mean? I mean, it just uh, uh, was so cool. You know what I mean? To oh, yeah. have a song done up like that. Whew. Yeah. You know, how many people write songs in the key of uh, G sharp minor? You know I mean? <laughs> I've done a flat minor, but never. <laughs> right. <laughs> We've all done a flat minor. Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, last question for me, Steve, is I'm curious about your your screen work because you went on to compose for screen. Um, in particular, I'm interested in the Justified stuff. So Justified is a series on FX, right, that you've been scoring and writing songs for for a long time. Um, the I never knew that the character was based on an Elmore Leonard character. Yeah. And yeah. Elmore Leonard has a connection to Detroit, where we're from. So, exactly. yeah. So um, how did you come into that work? And is there a a piece that you're most proud of yeah no there was i was there for the whole the initial run there's another version of it coming out that actually uh uh this takes place in kentucky the new version is going to take place in detroit i believe oh really cool actually yes yes and uh um yeah uh the showrunner is uh graham yost was the guy who hired me and and the way i got the gig was uh through a guy I wound up uh, uh, being very close with, um, uh, Greg Sill, who uh, was the music supervisor. And we'd been doing some stuff together film-wise. And um, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, uh, you know, my, my film career, my scoring career was definitely mixed. There was some, there's some things on my uh, IMDB I wish I could take off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, um, don't we all? don't we all yeah don't we all yeah no my film career i i loved scoring the film i i love the process i love being a part of something like that i loved being on a team i i loved uh uh, i loved the deadline i didn't know initially whether i could you know per our earlier discussion uh um toto never really had deadlines we would add another month onto our studio schedule constantly another week for me yeah we need another week you know we never really um uh you could see by my writing output with the band there was even an album that i didn't have any songs on there were so many writers in the band it wasn't like come on you gotta have three songs by august of this year or you're in trouble nobody cared you know what i mean there was no deadline so when my friend James Newton Howard, who was doing very well in the film world, asked me if I'd be interested in writing to film, you know, my my response was, I don't know if I could have music ready by Wednesday. You know, <laughs> right. I really didn't know. And uh, I found out that not only could I, but I loved it. I loved the discipline of it. I loved the deadline of it. I loved uh, um, showing myself that I could, that I, again, it kind of, uh, it kind of made me grow up and realize that sometimes when you go in the studio, it's work. It's a, you know what I mean? You got to get, you got to deliver. I never not delivered. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, you've got to deliver on those deadlines. And, um, sometimes your family has to suffer. Sometimes your personal life suffers, but, um, sometimes artists need them, you know, otherwise you never, finish yeah we, i mean that's where we started this conversation yeah no exactly exactly so um so there was a there's a lot in my film career that i wasn't proud of and it was kind of spotty it was kind of up and down i always i feel like i've won the lottery several times in life and uh my film career and the way it started was again me me uh, uh the first meeting i ever had for a tv show i got it the first movie i ever met for i got it and uh i thought wow this is this is easy <laughs> you know what i mean and then uh uh and then soon after reality set in and it wasn't always easy you know my career was very much up and down and uh luckily though i'm i'm proud to say though that it ended on a real high note with justified justified was a show i was really proud of to be part of i thought it was a very cool show it was very different 
I was kind of doing, working in a world, you know, it was a guitar, a guitar driven score and I don't play a lick of guitar. Mm. I, uh, uh, but I can compose for it. And uh, um, I had this guy, Mark Benilla, was uh, was my right hand man playing all the guitars and even helping me with some of the writing when when the schedule got too intense. I got to mention Mark and um, it was a great experience and all the producers starting with Graham Yost on down completely like ran interference for me. I mean, sometimes with TV, um, you know, in movies, you pretty much only have to answer to the director, you know, but in TV, there's all these camps sometimes, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And often you can get conflicting input, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, and like they say, everybody knows and everyone on television knows their job and exactly how the music should go. <laughs> <laughs> Of and, course. Uh, of course. You know, and you get you got the network, you've got the studio. There's all these different camps. And, yeah. and really quite often you'll get conflicting input. You know what I mean? Uh, as far as the direction you should be taking. And uh, I was proud of the fact that I could kind of thread that needle sometime and make everybody happy. But, um, you know, suffice to say, at the end of the day, I'm now I'm doing whatever the hell I want to do, which is writing songs and and uh, I'm using that discipline from television and from from film and stuff to finish stuff to Get make things sure done. a couple days a week I'm doing nothing but checking off boxes, even on stuff that's hard to do. That third verse lyric, that getting yeah. from the from the cool bridge I wrote that I wound up in some weird key, figuring out how the hell to get back to uh, the chorus. Uh, um, I, I love it all, and I'm I'm uh, I'm doing exactly what I want to be. You're doing. not making these songs just for yourself, though, right? Are we going to have a new album at well, some you know, point? Well, you know, point. Well, yes, no, absolutely. Goal? I'm speaking of which. I'm. Yeah. In, it's been six years. I definitely have enough low hanging fruit, very low hanging fruit, that I have uh, um, definitely another album. All kind of. I have more than enough for my next solo album. Um, I'm always hoping. You know, it's always in the back of my mind that what happened on human nature is going to repeat itself. Yeah, and, right. And by some fluke, Bruno Mars or Adele or The Weeknd even, or you know what I mean, yeah. the, the, the artists that I can relate to, yeah. that I understand that are out there are going to hear something of mine and want to do it. You know what I mean? Mm. Someone, someone who tours and has a record deal. And, and uh, I just want to be a songwriter at this point. And because uh, well, I love that, you know, I'm not a touring musician, but I do. Uh, I am, as you know, as we've talked about before, I am. Uh, this is where I start embarrassing the guests. I am always inspired by the work that you laid down before me, because when I'm doing the page 99 stuff, you know, when I'm thinking piano, I'm usually thinking Paige or Foster. But when I'm thinking pads and synths and arpeggiators and all that stuff, I'm always asking myself, what would Steve do? Because I want those sounds, the things that you put into the culture of American music. I want them to live on. And that's that's the whole goal of this. And uh, yeah, so now hey, I'm embarrassed. By the way, on Human Nature, that's not an arpeggiator. That's a written out sequencer part. But it's sequenced, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. That's yeah, amazing. but it's yeah. written out. It's not. It's, no one's holding. It's not a just holding it. Yeah, and it's gotcha. being arpeggiated. That was uh, David Page actually came up with that part. I can vouch for everything John just said. That he's not just saying that because we have you as a guest today. This is a man who named his dog Lukather. Yeah, so. <laughs> I had a greyhound named Luke. I love it. I did. So, I you, love it. Yeah, you think he's feigning uh, adoration for Toto? <laughs> yeah, I, I was learning. I was just starting to learn to play guitar at the time, and and that was so. My wife asked me, "What should we name the dog?" And I had Luke on the mind. I said, "What about Lukather?" <laughs> well, and his oh. idol, of course, he, being a drummer, his I idol was Jeff. Yeah. And he got into Berkeley College of Music just based on everything that Jeff taught him through osmosis. So there you go. Yes. Yep. All right. Well, All right. good luck on the next album. If you know any, uh, do you know any studio cats you could bring in to maybe lay down some parts? <laughs> uh, no, I really can't wait to share it with everybody because yeah, we uh, can't wait. Uh, um, it's definitely different than the last one, and it's uh, if you like, if you like my kind of music and my chords and my sounds and stuff like that. It's, it's oh yeah. Uh, um, I think I've taken it to another level here. Nice, cool. Really, well, I'm keep really us excited. I'm keep really us excited. posted if you want to come back and when it's ready to go. Uh, we'd love to have you back to talk about Great, it, guys. All right, Fantastic. thanks, Steve.
All right, guys. Hang on to my See, stuff. If you guys, if there's ever any follow up or or anything at all, and please let me know. Uh, uh, um, you know, I love I love your music, man. I really mean it. I really Thank mean. You. It. I really love 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 your version of Leah. Oh you know ah, wow! I, mean? I really do. Thanks. You know? yeah. Cool. It's very well. Special. Yeah, I mean, it was. It, it started. Uh, you know, we started with the percussion, like well, the way you guys did. You know, I read about the all the different guys on there, and then yep. started with a an arpeggiated pattern that I that wasn't me holding a chord. So I wrote that out and decided, okay, let's set the toto sound, and then let me kind of go from there. So cool, it was awesome, love it, great guys, great work all in your footsteps. All right, thank yep. you so much, right, Steve. We will, we will be in touch. All right. Bye-bye.